Sketches by Boz, Section 24. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, Section 24. Scenes, Chapter 17. The Last Cab Driver and the First Omnibus Cad. Of all the cabriolet drivers whom we had ever had the honour and gratification of knowing by sight, and our acquaintance in this way has been most extensive, there is one who made an impression on our mind which can never be effaced, and who awakened in our bosom a feeling of admiration and respect which we entertain a fatal presentiment will never be called forth again by any human being. He was a man of most simple and prepossessing appearance. He was a brown-whiskered, white-haired, no-coated cabman. His nose was generally red, and his bright blue eye not unfrequently stood out in bold relief against a black border of artificial workmanship. His boots were of the Wellington form, pulled up to meet his cordrowing knee-smalls, or at least to approach as near them as their dimensions would admit of, and his neck was usually garnished with a bright yellow handkerchief. In summer he carried in his mouth a flower, in winter a straw, slight, but to a contemplative mind, certain indications of a love of nature and a taste for botany. His cabriolet was gorgeously painted, a bright red, and wherever we went, city or west end, Paddington or Holloway, north, east, west, or south, there was the red cab, bumping up against the posts at the street corners, and turning in and out among hackney coaches and drays and carts and wagons and omnibuses, and contriving by some strange means or other to get out of places which no other vehicle but the red cab could ever, by any possibility, have contrived to get into at all. Our fondness for that red cab was unbounded. How we should have liked to have seen it in the circle at Astley's, our life upon it that it should have performed such evolutions as would have put the whole company to shame, Indian chiefs, knights, Swiss peasants, and all. Some people object to the exertion of getting into cabs, and others object to the difficulty of getting out of them. We think both these are objections which take their rise in perverse and ill-conditioned minds. The getting into a cab is a very pretty and graceful process, which, when well performed, is essentially melodramatic. First there is the expressive pantomime of every one of the eighteen cabmen on the stand, the moment you raise your eyes from the ground. Then there is your own pantomime in reply, quite a little ballet. Four cabs immediately leave the stand for your especial accommodation, and the evolutions of the animals who draw them are beautiful in the extreme, as they grate the wheels of the cabs against the curbstones and sport playfully in the kennel. You single out a particular cab and dart swiftly towards it. One bound, and you are on the first step, and turn your body lightly round to the right, and you are on the second, bend gracefully beneath the reins, working round to the left at the same time, and you are in the cab. There is no difficulty in finding a seat. The apron knocks you comfortably into it at once, and off you go. The getting out of a cab is perhaps rather more complicated in its theory, and a shade more difficult in its execution. We have studied the subject a great deal, and we think the best way is to throw yourself out and to trust to chance for alighting on your feet. If you make the driver alight first, and then throw yourself upon him, you will find that he breaks your fall materially. In the event of your contemplating an offer of eightpence, on no account make the tender or show the money until you are safely on the pavement. It is very bad policy attempting to save the fourpence. You are very much in the power of a cabman, and he considers it a kind of fee not to do you any willful damage. Any instruction, however, in the art of getting out of a cab is wholly unnecessary if you are going any distance, because the probability is that you will be shot lightly out before you have completed the third mile. We are not aware of any instance on record in which a cab-horse has performed three consecutive miles without going down once. What of that? it is all excitement and in these days of derangement of the nervous system and universal lassitude people are content to pay handsomely for excitement where can it be procured at a cheaper rate 
But to return to the red cab, it was omnipresent. You had but to walk down Holborn or Fleet Street, or any of the principal thoroughfares in which there is a great deal of traffic, and judge for yourself. You had hardly turned into the street when you saw a trunk or two lying on the ground, an uprooted post, a hat-box, a portmanteau, and a carpet-bag, strewed about in a very picturesque manner, a horse in a cab standing by, looking about him with great unconcern, and a crowd shouting and screaming with delight, cooling their flushed faces against the glass windows of a chemist's shop. "'What's the matter here, can you tell me? Only a cab, sir. Anybody hurt, do you know? Only the fare, sir. I see him a turn in the corner, and I sees to another gentleman that's a regular little lost that, and he's a comin along rather sweet, ain't he?' "'He just is,' says the other gentleman. "'Vin bump they comes again the post, and out flies the fare like bricks.' Need we say it was the red cab, or that the gentleman with the straw in his mouth, who emerged so coolly from the chemist's shop, and philosophically climbing into the little dicky, started off at full gallop, was the red cab's licensed driver. The ubiquity of this red cab, and the influence it exercised over the risable muscles of justice itself, was perfectly astonishing. You walked into the justice-room of the mansion-house, the whole court resounded with merriment. The Lord Mayor threw himself back in his chair, in a state of frantic delight at his own joke. Every vein in Mr. Hobbler's countenance was swollen with laughter, partly at the Lord Mayor's facetiousness, but more at his own. The constables and police officers were, as in duty bound, in ecstasies at Mr. Hobbler and the Lord Mayor combined, and the very paupers, glancing respectively at the beadle's countenance, tried to smile, and even he relaxed. A tall, weazen-faced man with an impediment in his speech would be endeavouring to state a case of imposition against the red cab's driver, and the red cab's driver and the Lord Mayor and Mr. Hobbler would be having a little fun among themselves, to the inordinate delight of everybody but the complainant. In the end, justice would be so tickled with the red cab driver's native humour that the fine would be mitigated, and he would go away full gallop in the red cab to impose on somebody else without loss of time. The driver of the red cab, competent in the strength of his own moral principles, like many other philosophers, was wont to set the feelings and opinions of society at complete defiance. Generally speaking, perhaps he would as soon carry a fare safely to his destination as he would upset him, sooner perhaps because in that case he had not only got the money, but had the additional amusement of running a longer heat against some smart rival. But society made war upon him in the shape of penalties, and he must make war upon society in his own way. This was the reasoning of the red cab-driver. So he bestowed a searching look upon the fare, as he put his hand in his waistcoat pocket, when he had gone half the mile to get the money ready, and if he brought forth eightpence, out he went. The last time we saw our friend was one wet evening in Tottingham Court Road, when he was engaged in a very warm and somewhat personal altercation with a loquacious little gentleman in a green coat. Poor fellow! There were great excuses to be made for him. He had not received above eighteen pence more than his fare, and consequently laboured under a great deal of very natural indignation. The dispute had attained a pretty considerable height, when at last the loquacious little gentleman, making a mental calculation of the distance, and finding that he had already paid more than he ought, avowed his unalterable determination to pull up the cabinet in the morning. "'Now, just mark this, young man,' said the little gentleman. "'I'll pull you up to-morrow morning.' "'No, will you, though?' said our friend, with a sneer. "'I will,' replied the little gentleman. "'Mark my words, that's all. "'If I live till to-morrow morning, you shall repent this.' There was a steadiness of purpose and indignation of speech about the little gentleman, as he took an angry pinch of snuff after this last declaration, which made a visible impression on the mind of the red cab-driver. He appeared to hesitate for an instant. It was only for an instant. His resolve was soon taken. "'You'll pull me up, will you?' said our friend. "'I will,' rejoined the little gentleman, with even greater vehemence as before. "'Very well,' said our friend, tucking up his shirt-sleeves very calmly. "'There'll be three weeks for that. Very good. That'll bring me up to the middle of the next month. Three weeks more will carry me on to my birthday, and then I've got ten pound to draw. 
I may as well get board, lodging, and wash until then out of the country, as pay for it myself. Consequently, here goes. So without more ado, the red cab driver knocked the little gentleman down, and then called the police to take himself into custody with all the civility in the world. A story is nothing without the sequel, and therefore we may state that, to our certain knowledge, the board, lodging, and washing were all provided in due course. We happen to know the fact, for it came to our knowledge thus. We went over the House of Corrections for the county of Middlesex shortly after, to witness the operation of the silent system, and looked on all the wheels with the greatest anxiety in search of our long-lost friend. He was nowhere to be seen, however, and we began to think that the little gentleman in the green coat must have relented when, as we were traversing the kitchen garden, which lies in a sequestered part of the prison, we were startled by hearing a voice which apparently proceeded from the wall, pouring forth its soul in the plaintive air of all round my hat, which was then just beginning to form a recognized portion of our national music. We started. What voice is that? said we. The governor shook his head. Sad fellow, he replied very sad. He positively refused to work on the wheel, so after many trials I was compelled to order him into solitary confinement. He says he likes it very much, though, and I'm afraid he does, for he lies on his back of the floor and sings comic songs all day. Shall we add that our heart had not deceived us, and that the comic singer was no other than our eagerly sought friend, the red cab-driver? We have never seen him since. But we have strong reason to suspect that this noble individual was a distant relative of a waterman of our acquaintance, who, on one occasion, when we were passing the coach-stand over which he presides, after standing very quietly to see a tall man struggle into a cab, ran up very briskly when it was all over, as his brethren invariably do, and, touching his hat, asked, as a matter of course, for a copper for the waterman. Now the fare was by no means a handsome man and waxing very indignant at the demand he replied money what for coming up and looking at me i suppose vale sir rejoined the waterman with a smile of immovable complacency that's worth tuppence the identical waterman afterward attained a very prominent station in society and as we know something of his life and have often thought of telling what we do know perhaps we shall never have a better opportunity than the present Mr. William Barker, then, for that was the gentleman's name, Mr. William Barker was born. But why need we relate where Mr. William Barker was born, or when? Why scrutinize the entries in parochial ledgers to seek to penetrate the Lucinian mysteries of lying in hospitals? Mr. William Barker was born, or he had never been. There is a son, there was a father there is an effect there was a cause surely this is sufficient information for the most fatima like curiosity and if it be not be we regret our inability to supply any further evidence on the point can there be a more satisfactory or more strictly parliamentary course impossible we will at once avow a similar inability to record at what precise period or by what particular process this gentleman's patronymic of William Barker became corrupted into Bill Borker. Mr. Barker acquired a high standing and no inconsiderable reputation among the members of that profession to which he more peculiarly devoted his energies, and to them he was generally known either by the familiar appellation of Bill Borker or the flattering designation of Agrawaitin Bill the latter being a playful and expressive sobriquet illustrative of mr barker's great talent in agrawaitin and rendering wild such subjects of her majesty as are conveyed from place to place through the instrumentality of omnibuses of the early life of mr barker little is known and even that little is involved in considerable doubt and obscurity a want of application a restlessness of purpose a thirsting after porter, a love of all that is roving and cadger-like in nature, shared in common with many other great geniuses, appear to have been his leading characteristics. The busy hum of a parochial free school, and the shady repose of a county jail, were alike inefficacious in producing the slightest alteration in Mr. Barker's disposition. His feverish attachment to change and variety nothing could repress, his native daring no punishment could subdue. If Mr. Barker can be fairly said to have had any weakness in his earlier years, it was an amiable one, love, 
love in its most comprehensive form, a love of ladies, liquids, and pocket-handkerchiefs. It was no selfish feeling. It was not confined to his own possessions, which but too many men regard with exclusive complacency. No, it was a nobler love, a general principle. It extended itself with equal force to the property of other people. There is something very affecting in this. It is still more affecting to know that such philanthropy is but imperfectly rewarded. Bow Street, Newgate, and Millbank are a poor return for general benevolence, evincing itself in an irrepressible love for all created objects. Mr. Barker felt it so. After a lengthened interview with the highest legal authorities, he quitted his ungrateful country with the consent, and at the expense of the government, proceeded to a distant shore, and there employed himself, like another circonatus, in clearing and cultivating the soil, a peaceful pursuit, in which a term of seven years glided almost imperceptibly away. Whether, at the expiration of the period we have just mentioned, the British government required Mr. Barker's presence here, or did not require his residence abroad, we have no distinct means of ascertaining. We should be inclined, however, to favour the latter position, inasmuch as we do not find that he was advanced to any other public post on his return than the post at the corner of the Haymarket, where he officiated as assistant waterman to the hackney-coach stand. Seated in this capacity on a couple of tubs near the curbstone, with a brass plate and number suspended round his neck by a massive chain, and his ankles curiously enveloped in hay-bands, he is supposed to have made these observations on human nature which exercise so material an influence over all his proceedings in later life. Mr. Barker had not officiated for many months in this capacity when the appearance of the first omnibus caused the public mind to go in a new direction and prevented a great many hackney coaches from going in any direction at all. The genius of Mr. Barker at once perceived the whole extent of the injury that would be eventually inflicted on cab and coach stands, and by consequence on watermen also, by the progress of the system of which the first omnibus was a part. He saw, too, the necessity of adopting some more profitable possession, and his active mind at once perceived how much might be done in way of enticing the youthful and unwary, and shoving the old and helpless into the wrong bus, and carrying them off until reduced to despair, they ransomed themselves by the payment of sixpence a head, or to adopt his own figurative expression in all its native beauty, till they was regularly done over and forked out the stumpy. An opportunity for realizing his fondest anticipations soon presented itself. Rumours were rife on the hackney coach stands that a bus was building to run from Lisson Grove to the bank, down Oxford Street and Holborn, and the rapid increase of buses on the Paddington Road encouraged the idea. Mr. Barker secretly and cautiously inquired in the proper quarters. The report was correct. The Royal William was to make its first journey on the following Monday. It was a crack affair altogether, an enterprising young cabman of established reputation as a dashing whip, for he had compromised with the parents of three scrunched children, and just worked out his fine for knocking down an old lady, was the driver, and the spirited proprietor, knowing Mr. Barker's qualifications, appointed him to the vacant office of CAD on the very first application. The bus began to run, and Mr. Barker entered into a new suit of clothes, and on a new sphere of action. To recapitulate all the improvements introduced by this extraordinary man into the omnibus system, gradually, indeed, but surely, would occupy a far greater space than we are enabled to devote to this imperfect memoir. To him is universally assigned the original suggestion of the practice which afterwards became so general of the driver of a second bus keeping constantly behind the first one, and driving the pole of his vehicle either into the door of the other every time it was opened, or through the body of any lady or gentleman who might make an attempt to get into it, a humorous and pleasant invention, exhibiting all that originality of idea and fine bold flow of spirits so conspicuous in every action of this great man. Mr. Barker had opponents, of course, what man in public life has not, but even his worst enemies cannot deny that he has taken more old ladies and gentlemen to Paddington who wanted to go to the bank, and more old ladies and gentlemen to the bank who wanted to go to Paddington than any six men on the road, and however much malevolent spirits may pretend to doubt the accuracy of the statement, 
they well know it to be an established fact that he has forcibly conveyed a variety of ancient persons of either sex to both places who had not the slightest or most distant intention of going anywhere at all mr barker was the identical cad who nobly distinguished himself some time since by keeping a tradesman on the step the omnibus going at full speed all the time till he had thrashed him to his entire satisfaction and finally throwing him away when he had quite done with him mr barker it ought to have been who honestly indignant at being ignominiously ejected from a house of public entertainment kicked the landlord in the knee and thereby caused his death we say it ought to have been mr barker because the action was not a common one and could have imitated from no ordinary mind it has now become a matter of history it is recorded in newgate calendar and we wish we could attribute this piece of daring heroism to mr barker we regret being compelled to state that it was not performed by him would for the family credit we could add that it was achieved by his brother it was in the exercise of the nicer details of his profession that mr barker's knowledge of human nature was beautifully displayed he could tell at a glance where a passenger wanted to go to and would shout the name of the place accordingly without the slightest reference to the real destination of the vehicle he knew exactly the kind of old lady that would be too much flurried by the process of pushing in and pulling out of the caravan to discover where she had been put down until too late had an intuitive perception of what was passing in a passenger's mind when he inwardly resolved to pull that cat up to-morrow morning and never fail to make himself agreeable to female servants whom he would place next the door and talk to all the way human judgment is never infallible and it would occasionally happen that mr barker experimentalized with the timidity of forbearance of the wrong person in which case a summons to a police office was on more than one occasion followed by a committal to prison it was not in the power of trifles such as these however to subdue the freedom of his spirit as soon as they passed away he resumed the duties of his profession with unabated ardour we have spoken of mr barker and of the red cab driver in the past tense alas mr barker has again become an absentee and the class of men to which they both belonged is fast disappearing improvement has peered beneath the aprons of our cabs and penetrated to the very innermost recesses of our omnibuses dirt and fustian will vanish before cleanliness and livery slang will be forgotten when civility becomes general and that enlightened eloquent sage and profound body the magistracy of london will be deprived of half their amusement and half their occupation. End of section 24